A few uh, weeks ago, I had uh, I had thought about writing an article, and I've done this before, but just looking at the headlines, I, I try to minimize the time that I spend on the news, so I look at the headlines to kind of see what's going on. And uh, after I looked at the list, I thought, why would, why would I want to uh, write an article about that? People, you know, need encouragement. They need to be happy. And you look at those headlines, and it's just absolutely make you miserable. But when God laid this message on my heart that I was going to preach last week, all of a sudden it dawned on me that uh, this is really an appropriate thing to do, to think about the headlines. I can spend 30 minutes talking about that. But on that particular list, one headline said, Life in America has never been more unaffordable than it is right now. Now, those of you that are somewhere around my age and you look back over the years, that statement is shocking beyond belief. Never been more unaffordable. Another headline said, the world is teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. And not, just, not just some third world country over there. Not even America, the world, is teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Almost, here's another one, almost half of all of the young adults, that's between 18 and 29, in the United States, almost half, I think it was 49%, in the United States are still living with their parents. If you wouldn't have done that back when I was growing up. Another headline, 95% of all of the population in America, here in the United States of America, I'm, I'm talking about well water. I'm talking about the municipal uh, water systems and what have you. 95% uh, contain uh, unsafe toxins. Now, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but the University of New Mexico researched that and claimed that it was true, and that might not be a big deal. You can get some bottled water. might be worse. Leaders at the U.N., Nobody be laughing at this one. Leaders at the UN make a seven-year agreement to implement a single global agenda. Let that sink in. I'll stop with the headlines when I get to the next because the next one was all of a sudden in the middle of all of this. War with Israel. Let me tell you. And I'm certain that a lot of the younger folks do not understand the severity of this situation. I'm not sure any of us do. Because it has worldwide implications. The world is living on the brink. And most people in America really don't have a clue. As far as they're concerned, they, 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 they don't care as long as they got food to eat and a good ball game or a good movie or this or that or what have you. We're so sidetracked that we don't even realize the serious condition that we're in today. But others do. Others understand. We're in a mess. And it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And all of a sudden, people feel helpless. They feel hopeless. And out of their despondency, they just decide to throw in the towel and give up. What's the use? Let me tell you, there's something going on. This very day, I begin my 58th year of preaching. And, and there's something more going on than we can understand. Whenever you see all of these professing Christians for years, all of a sudden come out saying, I'm actually an atheist. I've been wrong about this all along. And now the catchphrase is what they call de-churching, getting out of the church. It's amazing what is going on in this world today, and it's all as a result of demonic activity. That's exactly where it's coming from. Our enemy is Satan, and he's determined to do everything he can 
to ruin each and every life. To undo all of the good that God's going to do. Now we know he's not going to win, but he's not going to stop either till he gets stopped. The good news is that regardless of how bad things are, we have a reason to hope. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 35. I'm constantly thinking about all of the things that that I want to preach, things, you know, that need, I feel, you know, need to be preached. Brother Kenneth and I was just talking about that earlier there in the office. One thing I know, and that is that people need encouragement as well as education. I'm talking about scriptural education. We need the Word of God. We need to learn. We need to know the facts. But people need encouragement along with that. And of all of the many different series and things that I've preached over the years, to me one of the most interesting and inspiring both had to do with the miracles of Christ. Because Christ was not just entertaining people when he worked those miracles. Every miracle was a miracle with a message. Every one of them. They were intended not only to instruct us, but to also inspire us. And this morning we're going to read about one of those miracles, beginning in verse number 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, that's the Lord, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as it was, uh, as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was asleep in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Someone must have given that to him, don't you think? Because he had not a place to lay his head. He, I don't think he was carrying a pillow around, but I don't know. But he's asleep, comfortable. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I had a good preacher friend back in Cincinnati, Brother Carl Wyckoff, and he and his he and his family used to sing a song called The Master of the Sea. And that's what I want you to think about this morning as we consider this miracle of Christ. The disciples have, in this miracle, experienced something that they would never, ever forget. The question is, when we think about this, it's a miracle with a message, but what is the, what is the message? What is it the Lord's trying to reveal to them? He's been speaking to them in parables. And he did that for a reason. There were those that heard what he said but didn't have a clue what he really meant. But to his people, he spoke in parables. And yet, evidently, knowing them, the one thing that they absolutely were lacking at this stage of their spiritual development was the faith that they needed to accomplish the mission that he had given them. And the message of this is that he's the master of the sea. He is the one that calms the storm. He is the one that is in control of absolutely everything. There's no way that you and I can avoid the storms of life. And by the way, living in Houston, we, well, we kind of know about storms, don't we? 
Oh, and the hurricanes come rushing in and we batten down the hatch and we get ready for it because we know it's going to be bad. There are all different kinds of storms in our life. Things that we don't choose. Sometimes uh, the storm might have to do with our health. We have dear loved ones right now that can't be here today because of their health. And it's a storm. It's a battle raging every day. They have to face that. How, how, how do you get through something like that? Because, look, you're not going to avoid the storms of life. Job 14.1 said, Man that's born a woman's a few days and full of trouble. You're going to have a storm. It may, it may have to do with uh, your physical well-being. It might have to do with your finances. It might have to do with your marriage, your job. All different kinds of things. It might be that you're having a storm spiritually. You're saved and you know you're going to heaven and I have no reason to doubt that. But spiritually there is, there is a storm going on within you. There, maybe, maybe it's just a deadness. Uh, maybe, and, and I'm mentioning this because I go through those kind of storms. I guarantee you, Brother Kenneth goes through those kind of storms. The times whenever you just feel like, what in the world is wrong? There's a storm brewing in your life and you can't put your finger on it. You don't know exactly what it is, but you don't like it. It makes you miserable. All of a sudden, you, you feel like the joy is gone and there's no peace in your heart. And you're scared to death, maybe, of different things. Maybe it's... Over the fear of losing a loved one, over the fear of not paying your bills or you're going to lose your job or whatever it is. So when we look at this story here in this parable, I want you to notice, first of all, the danger that's involved. We see the surprise of this storm. You know, sometimes we create our own storms in life. We really do. The Bible says we reap what we sow, and there's a lot of times we get in a storm. We're in a situation that, that is the result of some foolish choices that we've made, foolish things that we've done, and we create our own storm a lot of times. But these men, I want you to know, these men are following Jesus. The Bible said that they had forsaken all to follow him, and now they're in a storm. Something about that, you know, at first just doesn't sound right, does it? Because they're in the will of God in a storm at the same time. And that tells us that being obedient to God doesn't exempt us from the storms of life. That's when we need to remember what I've mentioned so many times, that we're in training for raining. Yeah, it's not just about... It's not about you. It's not about now. It's about God. It's about later. And, and I know we all feel the same way. We want to, we believe Romans eight twenty eight. everything works together for good, but we want to see what the good is before in the next 24 hours. We don't want to wait a week or a month or we sure don't want to die without knowing what it is. What difference does it make? If God is the one that has set the agenda, if God is the one that is controlling everything, if God never makes any mistake and he says some good is going to come out of it, it doesn't make any difference whether it's good now, good later, or whenever, because God knows when, when it's the best. These guys really must have scratched their head out there wondering, well, he is asleep and here we are in a storm. Notice the suddenness of it. There arose a great wind. In other words, that was something that they were not expecting. Because whenever he said, let's go to the other side, you know, they could have said, whoa, whoa, I listened to the forecast. And remember, remember these guys are familiar with the sea. They're, they know all about that stuff. They could have said, it doesn't look good, Lord. I, I don't think I'd well try it today. They didn't have a clue. He said, let's go to the other side. They all got in the ship, and suddenly there arose a great wind. Unexpected, something that happened fast. One moment, everything is fine, and the next minute, 
here comes a storm. Haven't you found life to be kind of like that? One minute, you're, you're just, oh, you're happy as a lark. Your team won the game. <laughs> I'm sorry to bring that up. I heard one person said they was praying for him. I won't tell you who she was. <laughs> and there's not anything wrong with rooting for the home team. There's not anything wrong with some R&R. &R. Everybody needs that. But, but that, that's not the point. The point is that one minute in your life, everything is fine. You and your spouse are getting along, you know, everything's going good. Well, just wait a while. I love my wife more than anybody on earth, and I've had more arguments with her than anybody on earth. It never stopped me from loving her, and thank God she never quit loving me. And then there comes storm. One day you think you're going to get that raise you've been hoping for, and, and you need it because you, boy, you're just stretched thin financially. And then the next thing you hear, there are going to be some layoffs. And you're in fear of losing your job. The suddenness of the storm. Notice the severity. The ship was now full. I don't know about you, but I've, I've, been, I've been in a boat whenever there was water coming in. And I've been in a boat whenever it was coming up an inch or two in the boat. But when it gets full, it means that's going under. I'm not sure exactly how full that was, but it, it's, at the, it's at the danger level of going under. Things have gone from bad to worse. They're facing something. They can't control it. They can't fix it. And they just felt like they were helpless. What do you do in a case like that? You can't get a bucket big enough to bail out all of the water. You don't have, you don't have a pump to get it out. What do you, what do, you do? You're in a helpless situation. And keep in mind the source of this storm because this is not by accident. The Lord not only created this universe, he controls this universe. He has his way in the whirlwind. The source of this storm was the Lord himself, and he's, he's laying there asleep. It always helps us to realize that he's in control because when we feel like that God's not controlling this situation in my life. He's lost control. He either doesn't care or he's sick or he's asleep or something. That's when we get to the point of panic because we get that hopeless feeling. And let me tell you, regardless of how bad things are in your life, if you remember what I'm saying, it'll help you that God either appointed it or God allowed it. That's always the case. Nothing catches God by surprise. He either allowed it to happen or he appointed it that it would happen. He knew all about this storm. He knew they were going to get in the storm. And in their mind, he has put us in a place of danger. Notice not only the danger, but their doubts. Because here's, they, First of all, they doubted his concern for them. Notice verse 38. He said, Carest thou not? Now you and I read that and we think to ourselves, what a stupid question. Well, of course he cares. He died on the cross. Wait a minute though. Had you been in their shoes at that time, I wonder how you might have felt. Carest thou not? We perish. You see, they doubted his concern. They doubted his commitment to them. Notice that phrase. You care how not we perish. They'd left all to follow him, and now they feel like they're being forsaken. That tells you that your feelings aren't always factual. 
Somebody says, well, I, that, that's the way I feel. Well, so what? You can eat certain foods and get indigestion. That doesn't mean you've got stomach cancer. We can't go by our feelings. Jesus said, let's go, what, to the other side. If they had been listening to that comment, really letting it sink in, they would have known we're not going down in the ship. We're, some way or another, he might be sleeping, but some way or another, we're going to get across this thing. We're going to get to the other side. You know, a lot of our problems are the result of us not really paying attention to what God says. Oh, how important it is for us to learn to listen, and especially when it comes to what God says. L listening to him would have prevented a lot of fear and a lot of worries for them, and it does the same for us. Let me tell you, God's word has something to say about every situation you'll ever find yourself in, something that relates to it. Amen. Oh, it might not spell it out in exactly the same English words like you would like it, but but whatever situation you're in, the Bible says something about that. Amen. Those exceeding great and precious promises. And how many times do we find ourselves in a, in a scary situation? And, and it's like we go brain dead. We just forget all of the things that he promised us. So here they are in this dangerous situation with the worst attitude they could have because it's doubt. They're doubting. I mean, this being in that bad situation, this is a time to have strong faith, but they don't. They're doubting. But notice they make some discoveries as a result of all of this. I'm glad that all of our problems are tempered by the Lord. You know, Job spoke about but, uh, about, you know, being in the furnace and in the fire, being tried by the Lord and coming out as pure gold. Aren't you glad that whenever you're in the, in the furnace that God has his hand on the thermostat? It, he'll only allow it to go so high. It'll only get so bad. He's in control. And regardless of what you're going through, it could be worse. And I know maybe somebody's thinking, oh, you, it's easy for you to say that because you're not as bad off as I am. And, and that might be true, but there are people worse off than you are. There are people, maybe, maybe within the sounds of my voice, I, I don't want people that they're not sick. they got plenty of money in the bank. They don't have any problems that way. But they're just one heartbeat, one breath away from a devil's hell. It doesn't get any worse than that. You might be on your sick bed, and the doctor says you've got less than 24 hours to live. And you'll have to leave this world and go to heaven and be with the Lord and enjoy. We sometimes think about heaven as a demotion. The situation could be worse. Look at what, uh, what the Lord says here. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. I wonder if maybe you're here today and, and your trouble is some storm in your life and wouldn't it be wonderful today if you could leave here with a just a calm in your heart <laughs> that whatever happens is going to be all right I, look you can't control it anyway you, you can you can sit there and wring your hands and make yourself sicker by wanting things to be different but it's not going to change the way things are And they discovered as a result of all of this that, that the power of God is tremendous. <laughs> what manner of man is this? They are shocked. They, they are following the Lord and committed to the Lord, but at this stage in their 
spiritual life, they are shocked to see just the spoken word can calm the storm. Well, maybe they should have remembered what Genesis 1-1 said. Or John chapter number 1. I mean, after all, the Lord created all things by the word of his mouth. If he created everything by the word of his mouth, he can surely calm the storm. That's no, no strain for the Lord, no difficulty for him at all. It helps us to understand and to remember the great power that God has. But not only his power, but notice they also learn that his promises are true. What, what did he say? Let us go to the other side. Let's go to the other side. He didn't say let's head in that direction. He said let's go to the other side. That should have been a word of assurance. And the fact that they got there is reminding them. He said we're going to the other side. And sure enough. I didn't think we'd make it. But here we are. Just like he said. Have you ever thought about how the presence of the Lord. And how thrilling it is. They're in the boat and they're in the storm, but they're not alone. And whatever you're going through, you're, you're, you're not alone in it. I think about Noah was in the ark, but the Lord was there with him. Thank God for that. You think about Moses out in the wilderness all of that time. And the Lord was with him. Cloud by day and a fiery pillar by night. God just reminding him, I'm here. I'm here. The three Hebrews thrown into the fiery furnace with the fourth man in the fire. The fourth man in the fire made all of the difference in the world. Old Daniel in the lion's den. Think about Paul there in Philippi and he's in, in the jail and what, what do we do now, Silas? I had my plans. I was going yonder to preach. I had all these plans to reach all these people. Now it looks like, looks like it's all over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother, that, I, that you was following me and got into this mess. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. Maybe Silas broke down and was wondering, Well, nobody else there on their side except for the fact that the Lord was there and they had a prayer meeting and began to sing praises to God. And all of a sudden the ground shook and the, the prison doors were open and the chains dropped and now they're free. Just as what happened to whenever Peter was in prison and the church prayed. Little maid Rhonda, whenever, after he was delivered, he, he he goes uh, back to uh, Mary's house and knocks on the door and the church is meeting there and, and they're praying. And she looks out and she sees that it's Peter, but she couldn't believe it and shut the door. And sometimes, you know, in our disbelief, we're shocked that that God would really answer our prayer. Yeah. He does things like that. But so many times we find ourselves in a storm and we, for whatever reason, we just refuse to get serious about really praying. Oh, I know we can utter a few, a few words. Father, thank you for the clear sky today and the forecast that it won't rain. And, you know, but I mean to really get serious about prayer. I was talking to Jason the other day when we were talking about this overwhelming feelings that, you know, that Christians get sometimes, the, the deadness that's in your heart. And I, I mentioned the fact, you know, the Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We often use that phrase whenever we, it, it seems like God's not listening. We say, I, I, it just seems like the heavens brass and my prayer can't get any higher than the ceiling. Well, that's high enough. Doesn't have to get any higher than the ceiling. 
The Lord said he's with us. Oh, to know, have that assurance that the Lord is with us regardless of what the situation is. I can't think of anything more thrilling than that. And then to know that the purpose of God is in, in the end when it's all over and said and done, it will triumph over all of the forces. We think about the storms of life and these storms are caused by a clashing of the elements. You know, you know, heat, temperature, cold, hot, they clash. Let me tell you, the storms that we're going through in this life is a clashing, a clashing of the elements. And that is the spiritual powers in this world. Satan doing all he can to resist the will of God. But let me tell you, when it's all said and done, I don't know about you, but I read the back of the book and we win. When it's all said and done, when the battle is over, when when it's all over, thank God we'll rule and reign with Him. Amen. Amen. We're going to, we're on the winning side. And knowing that gives us a peace that brings tranquility to our heart. It's a peace that passeth all understanding. Somebody you know might look at you and think, how, how can you be so peaceful and, and not stressed out whenever things are going so bad for you? What a witness that is. What a testimony that is to others. Because others are watching how we behave, not just whenever everything's going good. They've got their eye on you when everything's going bad. They want to know then if your God's still with you. You see, that happened in the Old Testament whenever the Israelites were going through really difficult times and the heathen nations round about repeatedly said to them, Where is your God? Where is your God? Well, he's right where he always been. Where is your God? That's what we cause others to wonder whenever they see us cave in because of the difficulties. And the fact is we don't have to, we don't have to be defeated in life regardless of how difficult it is because of the promises that God has given. See, here's the whole issue right here. That you either believe that the person of God is trustworthy or you don't. And I happen to believe that you can trust him. I say that because of all of the wonderful promises that he has given for one thing. Wow, if you can't trust God, you couldn't trust anyone. But not only do I trust him because of the promises, I trust him because of the things that he's done in my life and and the, the way that God has proven himself. I just mentioned that today marks the entering of the 58th year that I've been preaching. You can't imagine how frightened I was 58 years ago on this day. God says, I want you to preach it. And I thought, I really, I really thought I'm just imagining things. And I can look back over these years, and if Bev was here, she could tell you. We've been in some difficult, difficult times in all of these years. And God's been there with us in all of it. He's never broken one promise. He's proven himself again and again. And there are people all here in this in this building today that could stand and testify. Preacher, I know what you're talking about. I've been there, and God proves himself to me. Let me tell you today, whatever storm you're going through, and, and you're listen, you're either coming out of a storm or going into a storm. You're not going to get away from them. You're going to need what we're talking about here this morning. Maybe right now you know what I'm talking about because there's a storm brewing all around you. 
churning within your heart and there's no peace, there's no joy. I want you to know we've got a God that can deal with things like that. And if you've never received him as your savior, you can take care of the number one major problem in your life here this morning by receiving him, trusting in the blood he shed to wash you from your sins. And if you're a child of God out of the will of God, I've got good news for you. You can come home today. You can come back to the Lord today. Your failure isn't final. You can come back to the Lord and he'll receive you with open arms. It might be just a heavy burden on your shoulders and that you're doing your best in your mind to serve the Lord, but there's a heavy burden. It might be, that burden might be a concern for some loved ones. It's a storm brewing in your heart. Ask God to help you calm that storm today for him to bring to you a peace that passeth all understanding. And I believe he'll answer that prayer. I believe he'll do exactly that. He won't fail you if you trust him. If. So it's all up to you. Will you trust him or not? Let's all stand, please. Brother Kenneth comes and our musicians, Father. If I could preach for a thousand years, there's no way that I could possibly say everything that needs to be said, and there's no way that I could, I could ever do anything to break through someone's cold, hard heart. But I know, Lord, that by your spirit and with your word that, that anything's possible. And I pray today, whatever the need is in some person's life, it may be overwhelmed with the fear. It just might be that, like the apostles, that their, their heart is full of doubt and confused. And Lord, I pray today that they'll find a peace that they've never known before, that they'll have a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, and especially if there's someone here that's never trusted Jesus as their Savior, that they'd do so right now. Would you come while we sing?